God, is there any ass on the actual committee? There, well, yeah. Well, lots of people watching us. We're live. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, meeting of the Family Services Select Committee. I am Councillor Wallet Idris, Chair of the Committee. I will be chairing tonight's meeting. The event is being streamed live on YouTube and members of the public and media are welcome to watch the meeting remotely and listen to the discussion taking place. Now I would like to welcome all those in the committee room one at Kensington Town Hall and everyone watching on YouTube. Before we proceed with the meeting, I would ask members of the committee to please make sure your mobiles are turned off. I also think it would be appropriate for us to start the meet, uh, to start the uh, with a 72 second of silence to remember those who lost their lives in the dreadful tragedy. Thank you. Item A1. Uh, the committee is asked to, to note the membership of uh, chair by, and vice chair as agreed at the full uh, council meeting on the 24th of May. Uh, um, I would also would like to welcome uh, Councillor Lindsay and Benjamin, who's not here with us uh, now. Councillor Lindsay uh, to the committee. I congratulate uh, Councillor Oscar for his appointment as Vice Chair. I look forward to working with everyone uh, throughout the year. Item A2, uh, do we have any apologies? Uh, well, so I have here, ap ap apologies for absence have been, so far been received from Kathleen Williams, uh, and um, yeah, Mohamed Bakhtia. And, and oh, okay, and Tony Baker. Okay. Uh, item A3, declaration of interest. Does any member have an interest to declare? Uh, so, uh, I don't think it does affect anything about the uh, governor of Colville and all the primary schools and the governor of the Okay, thank you. Any other declarations? No? Thank you. Item A4, minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of April uh, and the minute and, and the meeting held on the 24th of May. The minutes of the previous meetings have been circulated. Does the committee agree to sign them as this um, correct record? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, item um, A6, update on Holland Park School. On this occasion, I would like to adjust the agenda. Uh, we're so, not doing the item I, I'm, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna adjust the, I'm just about to say that. I would like to adjust the agenda slightly and just switch around so I can allow personal folks to go to another uh, meeting. Yeah, so. 
Um, in March uh, 2022, the Family Services Select Committee received verbal representations from parents of pupils at Holland Park uh, School regarding concerns over the proposal to run the school from a single academy trust to a multi-academy since that meeting in March 2022, the school has joined the United Learning Multi Academy Trust and a new head teacher has been appointed. This report provides an update on the recent developments and current school performance. I now would like to invite Councillor Folks, the lead member, and any officers to comment on the report. Are you going to ask us any questions? Or well, do, you, do, you, do you want to give us a brief? Um, yes, and, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Where we are, and then well, you've sort of um, skirted through all the, where we are, where yeah. we've got yeah. to now. So yeah. let's start from where we are now rather than going back a bit. So, uh, as we said, there is a new interim executive head teacher, mm -hmm. Dame Sally Coates, who um, is the director of United Learning as well. And they are in the current process of looking to recruit a new head teacher in the school. Yes. Um, and, but I don't know if Hillary might be able to update us on how, how they're doing and where they've got to with that. Um, the paper here tells us about the exclusions, the number of exclusions, um, which are only, only three in the last, um, uh, well, that was from 19, um, 2019 to 2022, so I don't know if there have been any further ones this year or not. We should say whether they have been. Um, you can see the numbers of pupils on roll. Uh, I know you've got some specific questions, but one thing I have to update the committee on that I think you'll be pleased to hear about is that uh, Councillor Josh Rendell, who is sitting with us today, has very kindly agreed to step up to be a new um, sit on the school's improvement board, and he's taking the place of Richard Stanley, who was the council nominee on that board. It's a very small board and which will then sort of morph into the, the local board after that. So I want to thank Councillor Rendell very much because what's really excellent is, of course, he's had the history. He's moved through the whole process of where we've got to and where we are. So I think he'll be very strong in, in uh, holding um, what we feel is so important for the school and holding the rest of the, the governors and the people on the board and United Learning to account about... Um, you know, the limited power that we have as a council to influence um, what is happening at that school. So that's a very sort of brief overview, but obviously we're all here to answer any specific questions that you, you have. And, and should I just say that um, we invited Dame and Sally Coates to yes. attend this evening. Unfortunately, because of the short notice, um, she was unable, but she was willing to be invited at a later date. That's cool, that's cool. Yeah. I think we'll, we'll, we'll take up that later yes, on. Yeah. Um, members, do I have any? Okay. It's not, it's not so much a question, but a comment, and probably addressed to, to Councillor Rendell, actually. Um, I think one of the sadnesses for me, as somebody who's been involved in education over quite a lot of years, um, has been how very little interaction other schools had with one part school. So I would very much welcome um, collaboration with them going forward. So if there's anything you can put forward as a governor and ideas on that front, whether it's with primary schools or other local um, secondary schools, certainly on my own, both my boards would very much welcome that. I don't know, Clara, have you got anything to add on that? Yes, um, there is um, stronger engagement from, from the school, from Holland Park School. Um, and that's collaboration with other secondary head teachers in Kensington and Chelsea, including uh, our colleges as well, uh, like Morley College, and also there's strong engagement with us around um, safeguarding and the actions that they are taking forward to address that. Yeah. Including presentations to the local safeguarding board. Yes. Sort of updates on the actions that they're, yeah. they're they, taking in terms of the action. Yeah. 
the school has produced its own action plan in relation to safeguarding to respond to the review around safeguarding and they very helpfully shared it with us um, particularly the membership of the local safeguarding children's partnership mm -hmm. and um, the senior vice principal is an active member of the subgroup that reviews it and provides um, updates helpful updates on actions which have been taken as well as the ongoing engagement with mm -hmm. children's services and safeguarding i'd also just like to add if i can offer any assistance i sat on the school improvement board for Simon and um, so if that's helpful I don't know the exact in the map situation. I don't know the exact relationship that we have, um, but I do know the things that we've got. It's probably one of the things that I have on my list all the time. Um, and there's some things that the teachers are working on um, about you know, issues if, if they're going to occur. So, uh, how do we? What do you think that we should be looking at as scrutiny to be assured mm -hmm. that the processes that you've outlined mm -hmm. are sufficiently in place? Mm -hmm. it, it must be that we should have at least that we're assured that the processes are in place that we use and kept in place correctly. Obviously, we don't have a pattern to get involved in a direct way, that's not scrutiny as much. Mm -hmm. um, but what would you think that we should be asking in terms of special? Should we be getting a report? about all schools in this respect, or certain ones in particular have had the history like this, what would your advice be? My advice would be that uh, we would follow the uh, well-established practice around this where schools and governing bodies, in this case it's the School Improvement Board, and we do have representation through Josh, Brendel, thank you very much uh, for that. That would be immensely helpful um, in order to have feedback, but as well as maybe taking up the offer from Dame Sally Coates yeah. to join a future yeah. meeting yeah. and give information directly um, from the school. And, and this being a school that we proved about the group, um, more, more reasons than usual yeah. to say that's going to afford the full interview into the local board. Yeah. Should we as a committee be asking for an update at some point in the future? And if so, when would that be? I think that would be appropriate to ask for an update, and I think we could be guided by that on that by you, and would suggest that could be sometime in the coming academic year, early in the academic year, perhaps tying in with when then Sally Coates could be invited. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And the well, or the new head teacher, yeah. yes. Could, could I um, ask a, uh, another question, which is that there was uh, some history with Coral Park um, to do with the arrangements when it was put into place that there would be a contribution to the local community in terms of use of some of the facilities. With all the changes that have happened, is that um, no longer the case, or is it that likely to happen? I'll, I'll pick that up. So that was actually in the lease. So at the moment, the school is still operating as tenants, a tenancy at will arrangement, and they haven't actually signed the new lease. And uh, we, in that new lease, I'm insisting to look at the community use because it was meant to be in the previous lease and wasn't ever followed by Fulham Park School. And actually, it's something that's really, really important to our residents, well, to everyone actually, that those amazing facilities that they've got there are much more accessible to um, other uh, groups, sports groups, um, charities and residents themselves and tire things out. So um, we haven't um, forgotten that at all, but it's one of those things that of course the, the lease sits with um, Gary listening the property department and um, we um, are slightly you know, pushing them to, to come back with what they're proposing in that. Uh, and obviously we want the lease to be signed. So that again is when we come back to speak to you the next thing I suggest that we very much address the community well, use yeah. and what's been agreed. I mean certainly the, I do want to say that um, the current um, uh, at Holland Park are being much more open. Mm -hmm. So for example they, uh, they've allowed a local tennis group to do tennis lessons there, that local people can sign up and do tennis lessons. So you know that's a real step forward, they've mm -hmm. opened it up to um, Solidarity Sport again okay. and offered for them to use it in the yeah. summer, which was something that they were always very sort of against doing that um, and, you know, previously. So they definitely have improved, but I think there's sort of further that they can go. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
go to make it more transparent as to how you actually access those facilities. But Chair, that might be part of the checklist for when we have the next question. Well, just to follow on from that, I'm obviously aware of the difficulty of getting it opened up for public, public use. Well, what grounds can I actually refuse? They don't own the building. And I don't understand what their resistance is that they don't understand. It's not of their building, it's a lease, they're using it. Do you know why? Well, it was in the old regime, um, before it became United Learning, the grounds was always on the, the cost and the security and the cost of the school. I mean, it was a slightly flimsy thing, but you know, that was why they didn't want to have the amenities open during the holidays because they wanted to shut them down and give everyone a rest yeah. and not have anyone there. But you know, now United Learning have very much taken that on board that it's an important thing and given that you know all the all the upset and difficulties that have gone before them um, becoming you know, taking over here, I think they recognise how important it is to be much more open and much more flexible in that. So I'm sorry, I'm slightly waiting to see what has been or which is being written into this um, new lease and which we will certainly look at very carefully and, and punch up if it needs to be, if we don't think it's gone far enough. So I find it difficult you know, to understand how they can resist something that was agreed, can't say do it, and they didn't do it. But I think that's changing. I agree, yeah. The second question I have is, is a bit of history, but did they ever explain, did someone ever explain the decision to go to the trust they decided to go united learning that that's that's <laughs> and that's a whole you know another backstory um but unfortunately as, as the, the, the short story of that is it was out of it was out of our decision it ended up with the um in the end the, the, the dfe and uh, and it ended up with um baroness baron herself in the end having to make the decision on the advice of civil servants and as to no which the three options she had that she was going to take. Oh. So despite um, council strong representations um, to maybe making another choice, we were overruled and that was the decision the um, DFE but made. They, but they never explained why. They, well, they did explain why. The, the explanation was that it was the least risky option because of the, the size of United Learning and the capacity they had, the, the breadth of um, support that they could get by just the other teachers and the yeah. um, SEND teach support that they could, and that they could also put it in place very quickly. So that was their, their real sort of reasoning, that they thought that the, the alternative option that we were keen on was just a bit more risky because everything wasn't really in place. Okay. And that's the you know, yeah, I mean, we didn't agree necessarily, but so unfortunately, we, we didn't, you know, there was nothing else we could do at that point. Thank you. Um, Richard? Um, you spoke about a uh, school improvement plan. Is that being made available publicly, or is it just a document to bring some of you family? It's the safeguard and action plan that people have referred to. Oh, okay. Yeah. So is that publicly available? It's not, it's not a public document at the moment. Right. Um, it has been shared, however with the safeguarding board uh, and being monitored by that board. Um, there may be a reason, it, there, there, there may be, um, in the future, they may yeah. want to make that public. In terms but of have you seen it? The safeguarding board has seen it, yes. the working group has seen yes. it, yes. Yeah. It's just, what we're talking about here is a massive culture change mm -hmm. in the way senior leadership and teachers interact with children and families. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's about the interactions between humans. I think uh, mm -hmm. that's the final word to my mind in the document. It's actually about the kind of the, the finer, softest side of things. And so it's, it's not just hearing from the board what we want to do, we actually want to hear from the children and some of the yes. teachers, including the TAs yeah. and the yes. SENCOs, about how things have changed for them. Yeah. Because ultimately, one of the key drivers for this was a real concern about safeguarding yeah. the culture that developed on the part. Yeah. So, so, so we can be we, we can be assured as a fine document. But okay? yeah. well, what we need to do is to go beyond that yeah. at yeah. some point. And I'm sure I'm sure yeah. David Sandy will give a will give a good account for what's going on there. But at some point, 
you, you and us, I guess, would want to hear from the children and the teachers and the families themselves. Yes. Well, there'll not be, say, starting audit. I mean, for example, well, at Faith and my schools, you hear yeah. from the children and the staff, yeah. you yeah. pick them out at random with a series of questions designed to show that the safety yes. thing is embedded. Well, they need to be audited. Absolutely. And I think to add to that, in common with all schools, they'll be doing surveys as well yeah. to pupils and very promptly as well, parents and carers of these children at the school. So there's a constant uh, feed feeding back about how they're experiencing it. So, yes, action plans are important and mm. it's got to be clear, mm. but equally that sits in the context of ethos and culture. Yeah, but your sense is then moving in. The right direction. Yes. yes. And actually, transparency, which I think yes. mm -hmm. is becoming more and more part of the new cultural norm, I would say. Yeah. So we feel far more optimistic in terms yes. of the um, relationship that we form with the, yeah. the school. Mm -hmm. So I'm particularly keen to try to get at some of the Hilarity of this and, and about the children who have special education needs and the HCPs. Yeah. Mm. So um, I'm hoping, I mean, I mean, I have to take your assurance that, that things are changing for those children, and I, and I would hope that the board would, would focus some of their attention on, on those children. Mm. Definitely. That wasn't something that previously had been yeah. dealt with very effectively, as you say. Yeah, can I add something um, In terms of children, um, with additional needs, mm. those with education, health and care plans mm. and those who require support but don't have an education, health and care plan, there's really strong engagement with our SEM team and our outreach team as well in supporting the school and doing what they needed to move forward on in terms of improving matters. Who yes. sits on the safeguarding board that has oversight of this? That will be Angela Plahan, but also it's chaired as well. So, um, Andrew Lafar has a head of safeguarding. And the vice principal presented the online meeting last week. So, yeah, it's on the 16th of June to the SOC group. We have a review SOC group, mm -hmm. and the vice principal uh, came along and, and uh, contributed and gave information about the actions the school had completed, those that were trained. It's all about the safeguarding. So you've got people available who can cross check, challenge and support. Can I, can I suggest, Chair, that if we, if we follow it up on what Richard said and ask those questions when, right. when right. The, the senior leadership visit, mm -hmm. um, also aligned with that is that if we, we could have further assurance um, along the lines you were talking about, mm -hmm. and just ask how that, that relationship works. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think it's probably more coherent for Catherine or for Jen, whichever one uh, is most appropriate. Uh, Colin Hall probably did turn around academically on our in a very impressive way, but there were very serious shortcomings in that safeguarding. What sort of a teacher of expecting the successor for Dame Sally V? Because just having got her CV, her potted CV from the United Learning website um, she's an educationist and a teacher with doesn't appear much experience of safeguarding directly. So what is the focus going to be for the uh, I would suggest that what the school will be looking for is someone who can balance the importance of attainment and not losing sight of um, are young people being the best that they can be, uh, but balancing that with safeguarding and a strong pastoral system in the school, um, which a number of schools have had to turn their attention to more recently because of the prevalence of that emotional well-being and mental health of our, our young people. It's not unique, but um, there's a huge amount of support going into schools and schools providing themselves. So I think it's striking that balance. Ultimately, it will be for Holland Park School to decide on the United Learning. To it is, but in a sense, analogous to when Colin took over 20-something years ago, mm. when, was it, would it be fair to say, Glenn, that Holland Park was a sink school then? 
it, that actually it's gone overall, it's fallen from grace so badly that they need somebody. I careful how I say this or how it's interpreted like not that we can turn it around uh, with the requisite skills that you're talking about and that we reassure and think there are people in abundance with those abilities and gifting. It's like yes they are I yes. I mean I yes. think we I think we would totally agree. I mean certainly what Hillary said would be if you're getting the right person having all of those quali uh, qualities. Obviously the different when Colin was appointed to when mm -hmm. this person's going to be appointed is the academy migration. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And therefore we can only but influence yeah. some of those sentiments that you're saying mm -hmm. as opposed to yeah. more or less instruct. But I'm sure but I, I think the thing that, that what you're hearing mm -hmm. from us is is we are pushing against much more of an open door mm -hmm. than a closed door. Definitely. So our ability to influence is 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 so much stronger than it was. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now, yeah, well, um, I think we will have to come back to some of the questions, and we definitely invite the uh, Yes. And we'll hopefully, in that meeting, we'll have some more questions, especially in the end. And I guess our focus is then on. It would be nice to have a little bit more information, obviously, ahead of the meeting as well. Yes, but it's, it's inviting the, the, the scene the heads yeah. and also a further update from, from officers. And yeah, if there is anything you feel we need to look at deep, also. But yeah, the community is something we should bring yeah, out more details on that. Um, okay. Uh, now, now we can move on to the next item, which is uh, it's A five on your agenda, and it's other learning. we can we can take them we can take them together. Is it easier to take it together or do you want to take them so we'll do A seven one first. Yeah. And then you might want to refer back to A5. And it's it's got um setting it's setting uh, the, the whole A seven is setting the report for um, registration services, economic development team, therefore the committee of services prior, uh, priorities uh, and areas of scrutiny involved over the coming year. The reports are designed to provide context for the development of the committee's work program. And we have Glenn here and uh, Graham, and I guess we'll take the first one first and then yeah, we'll the second one is good. Yes. Okay. So, can I? Do, yeah. Do you want me to give a slight just, overview? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll be to help. Uh, firstly, if I could give an apology because the he heading should be Children's Services Seen Setting Report. It says Family Services Seen Setting Report. Um, I'm sure that you can, when you read that, you see that it's, um, it's much okay. broader than Children's Services. So, can I ask officers, will that, can, it, can a electronic version be corrected? So, online, we, we get that, that published now. So, yeah. Can't you put an amendment in with a heading? We can amend it as an action. If you no, but can you do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Because I don't keep paper. Okay. Uh, okay, go ahead. 
Um, so the report, as you will see, um, makes reference to our previous inspection results, and that's the inspection of local authority children's services that uh, occurred in 2019, where the local authority was judged to be outstanding in all categories. Um, since then, we've also had the, the inspection of SD10D, and recently, this time last year, in fact, we had our focus visit on extra familiar farm. Yeah. Um, 1.3 identifies the seven priorities, um, and you will recall, as committee, this committee was involved in developing the Children and the Young People's Plan, um, and, the, and the various priorities that were contained within that. I recall you being particularly impressed by the engagement of children and young people by the scenario book club approach um, that, that helped them to engage in, in, in thinking about what the plan could look like. The report also um, gives an overview of our statutory duties um, and, and in particular um, this committee has the opportunity of scrutinising some of those duties even further in the autumn when we produce that parenting report and our annual safeguarding report. Section three identifies some of the current challenges, for example, cost of living crisis, concerns around children's mental health, um, and some of the things that we're actually doing to try and compensate for um, the situation linked to post-pandemic and, and the cost of living crisis. Uh, and then you will see a number of key priorities um, that we've set ourselves and a steer, I guess, in relation to areas that um, the select committee may wish to focus on in the next year. Thank you. And any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Folks, the additional funding to this 3.3 that was made available to schools, I know that the concept was that head teachers would know better than the council mm -hmm. how to access some of these little pockets of hardship, and so the council made this flexible to some available. Um, and I wondered what sort of feedback or report you're expecting on the head system, what they've done and how, because after all this is probably a million times. Yes, so. no, we, we have been monitoring what they spent it on and obviously we'd be happy to bring that back here if you'd like to see it. I, I, I would like yeah, to that's see it. quite interesting because actually mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that preschool meals were, was the, the priority. So there were things like um, school uniforms, mm -hmm. um, transport, and uh, one of the key things was more activities, so doing, giving children the opportunity to go out and go somewhere else to do something fun. So it was quite broadly spread, but um, the majority of the schools welcomed the opportunity to be able to decide themselves which were the families and which were the children needed the money most. Um, some of them found it a bit, you know, um, admin heavy, because obviously it was more hard work that they had to actually ask everyone and then administer the, the, the money themselves through so you know that was sort of one of the maybe the negatives of it which we were aware that that might be so in a sense it was a very good interesting trial pilot so right it was a lot of money that we spent on it um but um you know we, we put it in place you'll probably know because the ask was to give free school meals across the board to everyone which would have cost over a million pounds to do that and very much when we did our research we hadn't got the feedback from schools that necessarily that was what was called for by our schools, um, given that we have um, quite a lot of children in our schools who don't ne aren't necessarily at that level where they need to have the free school meal. So this, I think, was going to a 30% uplift for those children beyond the ones that were already getting free school meals. So it was that the middle band who weren't going to get automatic to get it, but might still need some additional help with the cost of living crisis mm. who this money was addressed to. I think what I'd be most interested in, in in assuring myself is whether the schools made best efforts to identify the right people. Right, that's a good question. Good challenge. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, we're on the issue of free school meals. I mean, from September, um, I think the, the bar is going to receive a from the mayor of London um, to ensure that um, all primary school children will receive it. 
Street School Guild. Uh, has there been any thought about how we then go to our pupil freedom calculation? Because pupil freedom normally just runs off mm. free school guilds, and so suddenly we've got everybody with free school. How do we work out our pupil freedom calculation? That's too tricky to hear, you can ask that one. Yeah, in terms of pupil premium, that would change those children eligible already. Yeah. We'll continue to do so, so that yeah. we can extend the funding sure. uh, for well, the broader cohort. But you know, the new year, the, the children that are coming in, Yeah. if you qualify for free school meals, you qualify for pupil premium, and so... Yeah, and, and what we don't want to do is... Uh, jeopardise the funding that comes through pupil premium as well to, to schools. So it will be just described as deprivation factors yes. rather than eligibility. Yes. yes. And it's a bit like your, your previous question, isn't it? Is that actually we want to make sure we're targeting the right yes. children. Yeah. Correct, absolutely. That's yeah. 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 I have two questions, uh, one very specific, one is rather more general. Uh, 2.6. 38 out of 40 schools are either good or outstanding. Can you just put it on? One part. Should we have one assistant? St. Barnabas. St. Barnabas. St. Barnabas. St. Barnabas and St. Philip is the other school. Right. That'd be two. It's a Catholic. That to me is splitting head. Yeah, but that seems like they're not responsible for this. Okay, okay. So, a different question. Um, we are out of it now. But lockdown was very traumatic for very many young people at school, those who were at nursery school and earlier, and equally. I suppose that'd be particularly concerned with those who were of toddler age and of puberty age when they were. I don't know if it's called equipment or have children word search, but I can't see any specific reference. What are we actually doing to help those people whose neural development was impaired during uh, lockdown and that they have preferred to spend time doing this? So um, one of the things that we're doing, we already, as you'll remember, have an allocation of money that we put towards um, speech and language and communication funding. Um, but we're adding an extra, I think it's around an extra million pounds that we've got to actually focus on those very early years and really to get in as soon as possible. Because we, you're quite right, those children have really suffered with their, um, their speech and language and communication because they've been stuck in flats, they've been learning from television or from WhatsApp, they often have uh, families that aren't speaking English so they're not used to being communicated to in, in an English thing and so this is why we've got this, this extra money from our Dodge Funds banks where we've managed to find some extra money to pay for this uh, service which I agree with you is really important because if you're starting at a primary school and you haven't got those sort of basic things then you're embedding that disadvantage going on which can easily just sort of um, develop to become a much more serious problem so if we can focus and trying to help support them really really early on mm -hmm. then we'll hope so that's one of the other things you'll see in this paper various mentions of extra support we can put in yeah. for, for mental health in the schools as well yes uh, so, uh, Pat, I, I hear all you're saying Please don't forget those people who are of puberty age going in, who lost out on the developmental growth they would have had had they been four years older or two years older, okay, four years ago rather than whatever. Yeah, I may, can I just add the, the, the other forgotten sector who I, I believe were very badly hit, were those children at the top end of primary school who didn't become the independent learners mm. and thinkers, then they weren't secondary ready when they went in. They, we've certainly in our school, and I know from conversations with other secondary schools, those year sevens and year eights who came in are emotionally much more immature. So actually, it's almost every year <laughs> got bad yeah. affected. Yeah. When you're in process of development, as if as a young person, 
every year. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And one of the things that that um, has shown up is that the children who have um, who have moved on to the secondary schools are showing sort of quite difficult behaviour mm. and much more difficult behaviour than they previously would have done. Because, as you said, they haven't really learned how to sort of socialise maybe properly and that step up has been extra, extra hard for them and I think that's very tough. Yeah. I would, I, I was having a conversation with my teacher at All Saints just recently about the new behaviours of mm. it's low level non-compliance, yeah. yeah. we say, yeah. and the problem is it's becoming endemic and it's not, it's not just us or conversations amongst the head, there's a great wave of it, yeah. Yeah. and so it's it's acknowledging it and making sure the local authorities doing everything they can to support those schools, because what we don't want is is to lose the ability to support and change behaviours. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right, and it's something picked up in that last safeguarding thing that there were younger children who not only low level but were involved in more serious actually higher level um, mm -hmm. at a younger age than had previously been seen and which is really concerning. I mean, what we can do David is reassure you hopefully when we bring our annual safeguarding report because I think what we yeah. will do is be able to describe the redesign of the five pathway um, that has now been implemented. I think you've already heard around uh, what we propose to do to have a more targeted approach, and in particular about making children more school ready. Yeah. But equally, um, key transitions for children is, is, is always a significant time in a child's journey. Uh, so some of the work that we did in there, the NHIP, the uh, North Kensington Inclusion yeah. Programme, who have embedded workers within schools in King North Kent, would be we are we are reviewing that uh, success and progress and trying to think about how we can um, think about that across the whole of the, the borough. Um, so I think I think the points that you're raising, particularly in the post pandemic era, are really important ones that we have to keep. It's a it's an interesting thing to tap into because the normal sort of approach to SNA or whatever is to try to find those in most needs and focus resources on that. In other words, it's looking at the apex or the key part of the primary pyramid. Whereas in this case, you are still having to look at that. Also, you're having to look at how the whole place is moving because if you don't do enough of that, the transition to more acute presentation. Which is why you can see mental health is a key priority yeah. because we're seeing more presentation yeah. uh, and, and more demand in, in that area. So, yeah. one, one of the things that, that, that we've had to discuss in pets too is it's not just in relation to pupils but in relation to the pets and the family yeah. and the teachers as well. Yeah. Everybody's been going through, through this. So um, it's, it's insidious, it's, it's everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. so, some thought of in how back to say I mean, how you in, in best in, in prevention at a low level that's right, to prevent the movie from becoming more serious as well as the important areas of more serious. Mm -hmm. Um the, the question I have is uh, sorry, just no, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'm just wondering uh, uh, about the, the interventions to help or disadvantaged children. Is that the other week I came across a charity that does intensive interventions with young children? I've forgotten the name of it, but I think a third of their budget comes from this borough. And the idea is for about a year, twice a week, somebody work with someone goes in to see the families. And this is from America where they um, have done, they have studies which show that these interventions help the children because they're very intensive. And I, I don't know, are you aware of... Are you talking about the West, West London, London Zone? Zone. Zone. Because we do, we do yeah. help fund West London yeah. and they do exactly that and they're okay. very, very... Yes. Sorry, I just can't remember the name of it. It's just, it's, they don't go into the family's homes, it's yeah. a dedicated social worker yeah. in the school at the, and they discuss... No, this is actually in the home, so. Right, then okay. I'll, I'll try and find out. No, no, so they have a key worker in the yeah. schools, they now have one in, in 12 of our schools yeah. Yeah. where they identify the children that they think are most in need of some support or help 
<coughs> what's really interesting about what they do is that they identify children that we aren't necessarily already identified by us, mm -hmm. which uh, who might be quiet or whatever reason, which, which is why we really love the work that they do. And then they decide what the right and appropriate support should be to them, whether it's one-to-one -one English, maths, language, or just going and do other things that help their confidence. And so how do they identify them? Uh, well, they have a special sort of, their key workers in the school is obviously talking to the teachers, but I think yeah. they also have a special questionnaire that they give to the classes, which they have a sort of matrix that they can pick up answers from that, which will show that some of the children need extra support. Yeah, they have a matrix, you're right, yeah. Catherine, that identifies children according to certain mm. levels of need. Um, we described it sometimes earlier. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and it's, and it's also their matrix is such that you can say it's different children as long as the schools may have identified, but it's more, isn't it, that they identify the children that they are most able to help, that their particular program and skill set. So the feedback I've had from the two schools where we have engagement is absolutely superb. Yes, I mm -hmm. um, Like St. Coe's, as you say, you know, we would struggle. Because we've been, as we've been discussing, there's so much need within these schools um, for additional support, additional enrichment, additional mentoring. West London are able to provide the intensive and carefully thought through interventions. So, yeah, it's very, very grateful to look at the work yeah. that they do. And their metrics are right out ahead of the curve, way ahead of the poverty. My question was, um, with the key challenges, um, are, are all of them, cost of living, mental health, are they broken down by wards? So do we know which ward is getting what? Are, are the numbers? Or we, certainly, we certainly know in wards that have the highest deprivation, mm -hmm. have the highest needs. So we would want to focus on how interventions to make sure that we are meeting those needs within those particular rules. But I, we, we are also concerned that the, because we have traditionally wards that have higher needs, mm -hmm. I don't want us to miss out in the wards that we might think they don't have that much need. And that's why we have the family hub approach, which, yeah. which takes a north and south um, uh, view of the support that they should be providing the communities in which it's served. With regards to the household support fund, as explained here, so that is obviously allocated to a specific group of people, and I guess one could find that ward for ward, um, which, you know, how many children in each ward who are eligible for preschool meals and things, so one could find that out. But for the mental health approach, I mean, that that is more sort of universal. That would be for all the children in the school. Obviously, we want to help support them with that. So it would be it would be difficult to put a, a number on a child's head because it would, you know, be for for everyone. It would be trying to. The other thing, um, gentlemen, the uh, family hubs you said are um, more perhaps more location than local families who come to for schools very often have a very uh, wide range of some schools don't. Some schools are part of the family hubs though. So, yeah. and, but they, they, um, the, 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 the footprint that the schools have during term time, time is, is quite greater than the ranges that just mm. at the time. So, one of the benefits of these um, experts coming into the schools is that they also can, up, uh, can raise the awareness of the teachers in the schools as well. So, it mm. becomes something because we're all learning, all, all the factors are learning different, different aspects of practice. And we have only next week, don't we? We have yeah. a um, planning group with schools around you know, what they think is working well, where we feel that we can do better, etc. So we're engaging with schools in terms of their experience. But equally, as Hillary just pointed out, um, schools are adopting a trauma informed approach, yeah. Yeah. and we're facilitating training, etc., joint, joint thinking and working with that. But mm -hmm. wards and schools don't always have some, no, some, no, some, some schools are in tight category. Mm -hmm. some, yeah, it's huge. Right. Exactly. I think yeah. and it costs yeah. cost borough boundaries yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think it's just making sense of a pupil population in a school as opposed to a resident population mm -hmm. in a local authority area. And in primary schools, generally speaking, the pupil population on the whole comes from 
the borough, but in secondary it can be quite um, different. But it's not to say that we don't have it at all in, in primary schools. We do have children coming in from different local authority areas. Simply when they can board a school. Yeah, schools on the borders. <laughs> Okay. Um, any other questions? No? Okay. Well, I guess um, um, we, we can move on to the next um, item. Um, 7.1. Um, it's a question. I'm happy to. I don't think. I don't think we. No, we don't think. I don't think. There you go. We're doing the same thing in terms of what. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much. Shall I just give a quick overview of the report? Yeah, yeah, that doesn't help. That doesn't help. I've met the others. I have become a What is your job? I'm the director for uh, communities. Maybe I have met you too. Uh, so this um, report, this scene setting report, just gives an overview of um, registrars, which is a statutory service, and it covers um, our statutory duties, sets out the um, um, legislative framework for those duties, and also covers um, our risks and um, challenges. And um, the statutory um, functions include registration of births, um, marriages and civil partnerships, as well as um, citizenship ceremonies, and licensing for the other uh, venues for uh, ceremonies. There are also some non-statutory um, activities that we undertake within registration services, including EU settled status scheme and then non-statutory ceremonies as well, like naming ceremonies and things like that. And um, th we are primarily based at Chelsea Old Town Hall. We do um, operate occasionally within um, Kensington Town Hall, and recently we have started um, ceremonies outside of um, both uh, municipal buildings and um, it is a 24 7 365 day service we're always available mm -hmm. and um, 4.3 of the report sets out um, some of our key performance indicators from last year mm -hmm. around births and um, marriages uh, as well as um, citizenship ceremonies and also sets some of our um, KPIs and in 2022-23, we generated 1.67 million. And um, in terms of our priorities, we have several priorities, but most are around um, developing the service, improving the customer experience and generating additional income, and how that all um, works together to improve the service for um, not just residents, uh, but our customer base, because we do have quite a few um, customers using the service who aren't actually from Kensington and Chelsea. Section 7 of the report, where we talk about um, what activities or what um, scrutiny may be interested in, we thought we'd leave it up to you because our service is such and our priorities are such that they're very much around customer service mm -hmm. and uh, supporting the um, service to improve. So we weren't sure what do we be interested in, so we thought we'd leave it up to you to discuss and say what you'd like to see on your work programme. Thank you. Uh, I've got one question, and, and it may be well, it's totally ignorant, so apologies on this. There's one, there's one thing in your responsibilities that seems to me quite different, but it may be because I'm not understanding what it is you do, which is the citizenship naturalisation. So everything else seems to be you're registering things that we can check very easily, certain forms, paperwork, procedures. When people come forward to be naturalised, there's all that, you know, there's this courses that go on, there's tests and whatever. But you do all of that, do you? Um, yes, you okay. do. Okay, and what oversight is there to make sure that that job is being done properly? Because it's a very different, it's not a money-earning exercise like the other, it's a... Uh, 
very important scrutiny function, I suppose, effectively. We work with the Home Office, we right. provide oversight um, okay. in terms of what we do around um, citizenship ceremonies. Right. So it's not just, a, a, you know, elsewhere it's a little alarm and say, you want to raise more money. Mm -hmm. What I wouldn't want to think yes. is we just, <laughs> yeah, fine. Thank you. Maura, can you just uh, distinguish between attesting and registering mm -hmm. marriages and civil partnership? What's the difference? And what is the difference between 1475 and the 1918? <laughs> I need to double check on that. I do think I know, but I want to make sure that I give you the right answer. So I'll double check and I'll get back to you with the response. So there are two questions. One is, what is the testing and what is registering? And second, what's the difference between those two numbers? Okay. Thank you. What? Um, uh, uh, the, it, there's quite a long list under five of things that you say that you will do and you need to do in friendly service. And then in uh, six, you basically said that you've got successful data that's reacted into thousand. Is that going to um, be enough to? It's enough to help us do all those pieces of work because the 350 is a capital bid to improve the physical building right. and a lot of these um, priorities aren't necessarily costing us. Right. So for example, improving our customer service, that is um, work that we can do then there's no additional cost to the service. And there's no requirement for you to upgrade your ITs um, we are doing that, um, and we're working with IT, and there, there is a cost, but it's a cost that we can cover without capital data. Okay. Yes. That was an interesting uh, observation, comment, um, about the upgrading of IT and so on, but surely that's part of the whole thing, like the council chamber needs to be substantially upgraded, it's not just uh, for so how is that, was that the figure you quoted, is that for everything? The 350? Yes. Yes, that's for all the refurbishment of the um, ceremony rooms in the Old Town Hall. Oh, the Old Town Hall? Yes, the Old Town Hall. Okay, not? Not here. Not here. Ceremony it's ceremony. our ceremonies, um, marriages, civil, civil partnerships, or the ceremonies that take place in the Old Town Hall. Okay, because the, um, the citizenship ceremonies also take place in here. Yes. So that's it completely separate. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, you said in your introduction um, you were developing an improvement, and I think you've kind of laid out here on, on five to developing and improving. So, and you also mentioned that a lot of your development and improvement is more or less like from customer service, just do better as opposed to. But uh, aren't there any other um, improvement that, I mean, would isn't there anything that it's costing? Like, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of it is uh, facing, customer facing. Yes. But there are going to be things that you have to improve and, and, and spend money on aside of the physical refurbishment that, you know, we have in 350 people. Yeah. Or my, my, because I'm, 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 not, I'm not convinced that, for instance, you might not need more staff you, if if you if you find the face you know the, the facing service is not doing what it's supposed to be doing or what you intended to do, and you might have to I don't know would you be able will you think about recruiting more people or is and will is that costed also or is that part of the three fifty or is that a different cost? It's not the three fifty is a capital investment. Yeah, and there's revenue costs. Um, we do have that built into our budget, so we do have um, sessional workers who are extremely busy, so we can bring extra staff in. Um, in terms of, for example, you, talk, you talked about our customer service, we actually have, I think it's 99.9% .9 satisfaction, but we want to do better, so we're trying to improve. But a, a, a lot of the costs are revenue, and it is part of our budget already, it's already built in, mm -hmm. so it's not taken out of the capital 350, the capital 350 is very specific, that we put in. Uh, to support our growth 
by improving the physical um, venues that we have. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Physical observations are it's perhaps in the future if you different paragraphs you make it clear at Cell Town Hall. I know that part of said primarily that two fifty is not clear. But the actual question I was I was, I was um, interested to note that you consider that the RPKC is in healthy competition with Westminster, yes. but work together. Uh, in what way is it a competition? Isn't it to do with where the residence is, where the people reside? Uh, no, no, because people can get married in Chelsea Old Town Hall, it's a venue. Yeah. So they can get married there. So we right. have to be oh, trying true, to attract marriages. marriages. Yes. yes, for marriages in particular, and that's where we generate most of our income is from marriages. So that's where the competition is. Right. Yes. And but not for citizenship ceremonies. I mean, how is that decided where it's done in which borough? I think citizenship, and I do need to double check this, citizenship is um, based in the borough in which you live. Yeah, well, yes. Yes. I'm sure. yeah, I guess yeah. I'm not sure of it. Yes, yeah, okay. it's based in the borough in which you live. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Maybe marriage can be anyway, I suppose. Yes, and, and um, Westminster mm -hmm. has the most marriages in London, mm -hmm. followed by Kids and Chelsea in second, mm -hmm. and so we're in competition. Okay. And any other any other questions? No. Oh, well, thank you very much. That's very informative. I think we um, have an idea. Yeah, a quick question: Where, if, if you're actually trying to go about it and improve your business, do you have any? It's a package, isn't it? Marriages are packages. Yes. You have the ceremony, you have the meal, or the, or the, the doom, or the whatever. Do you have relationships with any local businesses whereby you offer group packages in competition? With Westminster, yes, yeah, uh, we do, and we we hold um, two wedding fairs a year, and um, we bring in caterers, bakers, harpists, oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. so we we do offer um, a package, and we do support um, people that want to have ceremonies to access other um, parts of the ceremony that could enhance. Yeah. Thank you. Have you considered uh, uh, renting out the, the town hall for receptions? Oh, we do. We do. Okay. We do. Oh, yes. Because yes. I think it makes, makes sense, especially with the pot club now, because a lot of them used to get married and go on the road. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we, we have you, Josh. Oh. We can we can do this now if you want. Can um can can we take a five minute break? Just a bit. Yeah. Maybe three. Can we make it two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Sorry. Yeah. Just two minutes. Now you got your second. I think she talked about in Chess Town all the reason why we're in competition with Maribank. Mar
Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, go ahead. Do you, um, yes, I can do start. You, yeah, please. Well, um, thank you, um, committee, again, um, for inviting me to speak. Um, so, adult learning and the adult curriculum falls under um, this portfolio, um, Local Economy and Employment, as you can imagine by the title. Um, we've got Graham Hart here, who's our Head of Economic Development, and Harriet Duncan, who um, is our, our adult learning manager, mm-hmm. amongst other things Harriet does as well. Um, so, at the council, uh, we obviously provide an adult learning service. Mm-hmm. And that's for anyone. So, Jenna, could, could we just clarify which agenda items are going to be? Five. Five. Oh, five first. Because you just, you do, you just, do, do five. It doesn't matter. Okay, which, yeah. Which do you want to do? It, it, it doesn't matter. We can do it because they go together. Five first. That's Sorry, I didn't. Yep. Um, uh, adult learning, and that's uh, plus 19 years old. Mm-hmm. And most of our adult learning, I think all of our adult learning, and I think Harry and Graham can confirm, come from a grant from the PLA, mm-hmm. um, which we can then can divvy up amongst our other service providers, and we commission that here in the borough. Yeah. Um, obviously, our biggest provider of adult learning, uh, probably the most famous one, is Morty College, which is in North Kensington and in Chelsea, uh, and they do um, a range of services, a range of learning provisions, uh, basic uh, North Kensington especially, which is their Centre for Skills, um, providing all these services um, as well. Um, but as you can see from the report, there's a range of services provided from um, yeah, English or other language, um, for uh, other extracurricular activities as well. Um, we've got other priority areas, vocational requirements, maths and English, all that kind of stuff um, that uh, adults may wish to uh, learn about. Um, but happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. Sorry, uh, as someone comes from the school sector of an adult learning, uh, I was surprised to see us rated, I'm sorry, it's going to sound awful now, that we're, we're only rated good, that they're not rated outstanding, whereas in virtually all the borough of services were rated outstanding. I do take it that this um, Ofsted inspection was back in 2018, so we've obviously come some way on. But I wondered um, what plans we've had to improve our service. Um, and, and where we thought that our, our weakness lay, I suppose, in order to achieve that. Great, well, Harry, when you're using pre my okay. time as a councillor, so. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. We, yes, we have been on a journey of in, in, in improvement because we had, uh, I think, under one of the previous Ofsted regimes, which we had a requires improvement yeah. a number of years ago, and then we did achieve uh, good and we held good in, through two inspections. Yeah. And actually, for the for the adult community learning sector, yeah. unlike the school sector, the vast majority of providers are good. A very small percentage are outstanding, and, and also quite a small percentage um, mm-hmm. requires improvement. Um, and in terms of the the areas that we needed to focus upon post that inspection, and this is where I'll ask Harry to provide a little bit more detail in terms of the areas that we needed to, the challenges and areas we need to make to make improvement. Uh, and some of those are related to the nature of this, which it's not a statutory service. The learners volunteer and choose to undertake their courses of study. So, for example, you can't force somebody to turn up every day for the learning, although most learners are very well motivated and do so. So that's just one example of the sort of slight differences you get between the the statutory education provision and the adult learning sector. But perhaps Harry can touch upon briefly some areas in terms of where where the service has been improving and needs to continue improving. So we were were at the time of the last inspection, it was was partly to do with um, (coughs) attendance was one of the things that I had a a, a big grilling with the inspectors Mm -hmm. about. And so that was what Graham's kind of referring to, people's lives get in the way of them being able to come all of the time, every time. It is a, um, something that we've worked on with providers about how do you make it very clear that this is you're signing up for a course and you need to be here for the whole period of the course and, and it's not just a club. You are, you are expected to you know, attend, you will miss out by not attending. And so we've done a lot of work on that. Um, interestingly, during the pandemic, when we were delivering online, and that's something that we had never done before, um, our attendance figures went up to, to much higher than they'd ever been. We had a, we have a target of ninety percent attendance, and so we 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 hit that target now and continue to maintain it, even though we've now gone back to face to face delivery. 
Um, other things that we were challenged on last time were about um, the use of ILP, so in, in individual learning plans, and making sure that the learning is fit for the individuals who are attending. Um, and so that's something that we've been doing a lot of work on, and so making sure that, that, that the, the methodology that we use is fit for different types of learning. It's very different to have an individual learning plan for, say, pottery class, than it is to, for if you're doing a, a qualification in ESOL. So, you know, you have a curriculum, a specification, and all those kind of things are slightly different depending on the type of provision that you've got. So, we're doing a lot of work on how can you do those types of things in, in classes like you're not usually standing there in a, in, a, in, a, in a garden class with a piece of pen and paper. And, you know, so, so how, how do you account for the progression? For people during this, I'm sorry, follow up question to that then yeah. is does Ofsted, like in the school sector, make allowances for the, for the nature of the um, students? So, in other words, I'm assuming because the KNC you have a huge number of non English speaking students, so that obviously would require a bigger learning curve. So, do they look at your progress with these people? They, they do, they do look at progress and they look at the progress of individuals in, in the classes that they're in. They don't actually give you kudos for having lots of people with disadvantage in neighbourhoods because adult learning services across the, the country are dealing with that nature of people. Um, what they're looking at, they do give us kudos for when our we know the learning needs of our learners and we are providing what they need and, and want to do. So, so that fit between what the curriculum is is offering and what people actually want to come and do. That's quite a big thing, which I think we've worked on a lot recently um, and in the last couple of years specifically about making connections between um, what, you know, so for example, jobs that are available in the borough and what people are choosing to want to go into. So, so providing sort of routes into area, um, industries that people may not have thought of before or not, maybe didn't want to go into before but actually now post pandemic not going to travel so far you know what's locally available for me you know where where where, where are the big employers going to be i was actually going to ask that and is that the normally driver for most of the adults it hasn't been um so so out of our uh, curricula i mean our, our allocation we get a portion of money for community learning and a portion of money for accredited provision and the accredited pro provision has grown since i've been here so we we are on i, mean, I can't remember exactly the figure it's something like nine hundred thousand pounds worth of it is community learning that's all focused on encouraging people into learning, to support their um, mental well-being, to help them socialise, to um, do a quite broad range of you know, confidence building things, skills development. But it's about learning in its own right more than it is about skills development towards employment. Since I've been here, we've grown the proportion of allocation. We've got more allocation for um, the other side of stuff, which is qualifications. Um, and so that's been driven by getting better qualifications for um, people who are doing ESOL. That's um, that area of work, which is preparation for life and work, is now 50% of the delivery that we do. Um, but we also are driven by the GLA now. We were funded by the Education Skills Funding Agency. Now the GLA is driving us more towards vocational provision um, and things which will directly help people towards work. I keep thinking about our curriculum as a niche. We are working with the, the least ready to go to work. And so we are looking at pre-entry levels of ESOL, sometimes people who are pre-literate from their home country, pre-literate in English, and it's a much longer journey. What the benefits are provided? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Morley College must be the... the Morley College provider. is our main provider. We used to give them a lot more money than we do now, but um, so we've had... We've had in our last procurement round, we were, we were trying to identify providers who could do more 
Um, so we work with Westway Trust with no venue of opportunities, with um, Open Age, Age, Clement James, and those are the big providers, so plus Morley College, those are all the ones that get a big contract with us. We've also got um, an <coughs> organisation called Learning, um, Learning Curve, and they deliver um, qualifications entirely <coughs> for us. Um, then we've got some smaller organisations that we've drawn in because they have a sort of a niche that, that we were interested in. So Writers and Scribes does poetry classes with people. Um, then there is, we, we did a bit of work with um, Goldfinger Factory, so that's a local organisation, and they were delivering um, a course in building bird boxes, so practical woodwork, um, and that was with families. So I'm also always trying to grow the family learning provision as a as a useful um, entry into into learning for people who may have had a poor experience at school and don't really want to do much learning. One of those is Hammersmith Community Gardens Association. So that was one of our last from our last procurement round. They came in. They deliver. It's it's. I think it's multi useful. It's families. It's outside. It's um, getting your hands in the ground and doing sort of horticultural type of activity. Um, and so and so that's kind of where I'm I'm at with with trying to encourage new providers in. We sometimes work with very small providers, Kensington and Chelsea um, Forum have been doing mindfulness program for us for people over, over 50s. Um, we also have um, um, some a direct delivery arm, which is a very small amount of family learning provision, and that's working through Holmes Hill House and St Anne's and Avondale School, and that's helping parents to understand the the child's curriculum and giving them skills so they can support that child's development. In terms of the commissioning framework, how does it make allowance for people with learning difficulties? That was an interesting one. We used to have a, a contract with um, Action Disabilities, Kensington and Chelsea, mm -hmm. um, but sadly they have, post, post lockdowns, they have decided to change how they, or what their remit is going to be. However, we 18% of the people who enrol with us have a declared learning disability or difficulty. Um, and they are managed, sort of not managed, they, they go to the main the rest of the mainstream provision, and because it's very individualized, there is a, a quite a close relationship between providers and the, the tutors and the learners, so they're supported within that framework. We've we've had conversations quite often with Steve Coomber and that team, which is about SMD trans, you know, transformation to adulthood. Um, that's what we we're kind of looking for. We, we, we haven't had a, a procurement round for the last four years, maybe. So what we we're trying to do is expand our provider base again. So that we be, can, yeah. Just one of the unique, we're not totally unique, but quite often the adult learning services are in-house directly delivered where there's employed tutors and adult aid centres. Historically, you can imagine all sorts of setups. Here it is very much a commissioned out model, which enables us to have a mixture of different providers and to be able to adjust that all over time. Uh, and uh, interestingly, the relationship with the historically with Kensington and Chelsea College as it was before it became the merger with Morley College, that was very much the predominant part of the, of the provision. And as it had its own problems and troubles in terms of just actually recruiting learner numbers and delivering the quality of the provision. Actually, that the numbers and their contract with us went down from say over fifty percent of our allocation of learners to more like thirty percent of our allocation of learners, and at the same time, that range of community providers that are quite small organisations, and these contracts are quite significant in terms of the size of these organisations, they developed and grew, and we worked with them capacity-wise to meet back to the offset question to meet the crime of the burdens and the requirements to have everything up to the standard that, that's required. And inevitably along the way, we probably lost some very small, very niche providers who effectively couldn't couldn't go on that journey or the administration was quite heavy in terms of the relay mm -hmm. to the, to their overall uh, levels of resources. So to commission that model and the framework that's coming in gives us the flexibility to be able to 
pre-qualify a number of organisations for up to five years and to open it every year so people can join it. And then each year when we know how much money is coming from the GLA, we can run a call-off competition and allocate the, the grant for the learning appropriately, whether it's accredited or non-accredited, from that mix of providers uh, as we progress. So, so the framework will give us some flexibility. Uh, and in particular with this today, is the sort of specification and curriculum which we expect the providers to respond to. That's the appendix you've got attached to this, which is kind of well, what, what gets delivered, what do the learners receive at the end of it. So that's the, we really yeah, like so sort of feedback. Just finally for me, Chair, if I can. So, Graham, in terms of the, the, the kind of the steer and the direction, how it's explained it very well in terms of what the GLA, uh, you know, how, how, they're, how, they're, how they're driving that allocation of resources. But do they look for evaluation as well in terms of the outcomes from the money that they've allocated to you? I mean, it's yes. a tricky thing, obviously, you know, because it's like that to Morley College, you know, you yeah. know, that data doesn't lie with you. Morley College doesn't necessarily have to ask that person, okay, have you got a job? No. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting, yeah. interesting thing, isn't it? It's just the one, it's the one that to think about, think it through really, in terms of, yeah, yeah. Could, can we somehow... We have to do a learner survey. I guess, yeah. yeah. And yeah. again, our providers it's have to do that. Yeah. Uh, there's destination measures in terms okay. of what's the destination of the learner, you know, uh, months after they've completed their learning, you know, have they, have they progressed, have they gone into work? There's also the kind of feedback from the learners themselves uh, yeah. during during the course of the study. So those are some of the main, and then obviously if they're achieving qualifications yeah. or if they're achieving their aims, yeah. Yeah. you know, how they have completed their course of learning successfully. So these are these are the different elements that can kind of come into to measuring success or me measuring whether people are achieving what, what they set out to, to, to achieve. So you should have quite a rich data source. Yeah, yeah we do. The, the, the GLA themselves are mostly concerned with the learners who are on roll in that year, so it's the numbers of people who are the unique num number of learners, the enrollment numbers, the achievement and uh, uh, rates. And so that's what they're mostly concerned with. Yeah. So the same as Ofsted. Yeah. Um, but we, we also have been undertaking a community impact survey annually just to find out with, where they ring up people a year after they've done their course to find out what they are doing now and what they, you know, lots of that is to, is to do with further learning largely, but there is a, a proportion of people who it's also gone and gone a job. We also ask people to feed back to us when they've got a job, and actually because of the nature of the smaller local community organisations, often people come back and say, hey look, now I'm, I'm doing this. So the case studies that we have are quite um, inspiring really, and that's the, the best part of, of this work, I feel, for myself, is, is the impact you've had on somebody's life, and it's quite powerful. Could, go ahead. In school, certain subjects have problem recruiting. Maths, for example. I'm not expecting physics. I know that physics is not mine. It's a deal, but maths. It could is. be if they want, if we wanted to. But yeah, maths. No, it's. So, it's, so yeah. can you just um, explain the, the overall situation to regard where we whether more and whether fewer teachers. And second, I assume that your job means that you know most, if not all, the teachers at all the different community centres, and presumably it can be helpful, but actually you know how good each of the teachers are. We, we do have to do observation of teaching and learning. So that's probably common, you know, you probably do that in schools also. So we have schemes that do that, and we have to look at everybody at least once a year. So while they're not our chief, chief teachers, we're not paying them directly, we do go and observe every tutor each year um, at the venues. Sometimes that's joint observation with the person who observes them from the um, organisation itself, and sometimes that's we, we go and do it. They may not have a scheme themselves, but they're very tiny. Um, so yeah, we we are aware of the quality of of the teaching staff that we have. We have chosen not to grade them anymore because that was a um, a thing which became too judgmental in a way, and the, and the tutor became obsessed by the number that they were given rather than 
so now we're trying to do developmental observation. So that instead of that, we are supportive, trying to do a supportive thing where this is what we saw today, and this is how you could have improved it. So, so that's that's sort of where we're on that journey, where we're trying to be supportive of tutors. We have tutor meetings as well as organisational meetings, so that so that we're developing the tutors themselves outside of the scope of um, the organisation that they work for, and that's about sharing good practice between themselves as well as um, things that we find out. So we see stuff at different centres with different tutors and matching up people's ability and, and in order to try to encourage people to bring about improvement. Um, it's harder because they're often hourly paid people. Um, sorry, the beginning of the question. I think there have been examples and of our providers who've struggled to recruit tutors yes. and be competitive employers uh, in, in the marketplace that some have struggled or it's taken them a while to recruit. I can't comment upon specific subject kind of tutors, but tutors generally yeah. has, been, has been an issue. And, and also we find, and it's a risk we have to manage for the service, where the key person who's managing the delivery for a small community organisation then moves on. Uh, and there, who who assumes that responsibility and, and is is our key person in terms of delivery for that organisation? We have to work very closely on those transitions when when those people move on. But it, it, there have there have clearly been issues in terms yeah. of th there's more money going into maths tuition, so they're levelling up money. I'd call multipliers going into maths and new supervision, but it's you need to make that a creative sell, uh, make it attractive to to learners. Uh, and there are ways of doing that, but we, we need to grow that at part of the provision too, yeah. because we've been allocated additional money in the next uh, three years, about £38,000 a year, to do some additional multiply maths and numeracy time provision. Okay, so you, so you have a situation where you have half a dozen plus or minus community providers, and you have teachers there, uh, maybe self-employed, if one of them goes, two of them go, have you ever had to tell, would you ever tell a community centre, sorry, you know, like scratch, two people have left out of your three or your four, we will put commensurately more money to a, to, well, we'll, we'll divvy it up mm -hmm. either equally or we'll put it all to that particular one there. We have had to be flexible in the air or based upon achievement and based upon providers who are doing better than others and who can. can, can take an increase in their budget or those that have not achieved and therefore they'll not although we've allocated a certain amount they'll not achieve and draw down the full amount so that's an we have to manage quite closely the progress during the academic year each term uh, i don't think we've had to we've had to work very closely with providers where there have been staff changes but i yeah. don't think it's got the point of have to say i'm sorry we can't, you, you you can't do any more we have had providers who said they're not sure how much they could do in the next period and to, to have to develop a plan with them to kind of as, as they recover and as they develop their provision. That's certainly part of it. Would you be willing to do that? We, we have done. I mean, there are there are two organisations. No, sorry, the issue of putting the plug. Well, we have had examples by mutual agreement yeah. where providers have mm -hmm. said they're not going to so, yeah. You know, we we because of obviously we've taken issues to them during during the, the year, and at the end of that, after the years, decide that they will they'll pull out or they'll not they'll not continue. Yeah. So we do have to have a hard edge to the quality and the delivery as part as part of it. But it's usually being they've seen the issues, and they if they've not if they're not able to recover it for the next year, then they'll probably not participate in the provision. I suppose what I'm wanting to hear is that you would be willing to comply. Be, rather than do it with that agreement. Uh, if, if necessary, I don't think we it's got that bad. I know, that I know it hasn't, but that's why I'm pushing it out of exclusion. In it. Yes, but we would. If it, if it, if it absolutely kept, came to it, we, we, do, we, we would. And indeed, every time we've had the procurement, some providers might have cut the mustard and have fallen away during the procurement. The, the other thing is that we don't give the money up front. We, we give a third of the contract value to providers at the beginning of the academic year, and subsequently they have to earn the rest of the money. So we pay them in arrears for learners as and earnings through arrears. So if they are failing through the year to deliver, 
they won't get any more money. Huh? Or if it's qualifications, you only get paid on the actual qualifications they deliver yeah. successfully. So that, that was a that's a, a, a fail a way to avoid giving a, a huge budget to somebody and then them failing to meet and having to so, claw it back. So it's a question I had. Um, you were talking about um, you, know, you or the providers have conversations with these tutors. Um, it, they sound very different to the sort of conversations that are happening annually in performance management reviews. In other words, you talked about sporting, mentoring. It's all a give, it's all a lovely, it's all warm and fuzzy. But where are the targets? Where are the push? Where's the balance that you have in the teaching sector? So in other words, you could have some fairly rubbish, but very enthusiastic tutors. who just keep on delivering. We, we, we have much. an expectation that they have a teaching qualification, and that's where the standards of how the teaching happens mm -hmm. is from. Adult learning is slightly different, large parts of it where there's no qualifications so and there's no syllabus, it's not quite the same demand as getting through SATs and stuff like that, unless they're doing a qualification course. Um, is it still not possible to set up this? And I appreciate they would all be different. Yeah. The, 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 the bit that's about performance management belongs to the organisation that hire, hires them. Um, although there are, um, if, if, a, if a particular class is, you know, we, we look at the data by um, classes and the success rates uh, as such, we, we are very concerned if it drops below 90%. Any that are below 90%, we are looking at why is that, who, who's teaching on it. We would tell an organisation if it's persistently too low that we, we aren't going to pay you to deliver that anymore. Um, and that's all part of the, um, the discussion um, that we have about quality and also about what are you going to do. You know, people can say they'd like to deliver stuff for us, which we don't want to buy. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I was going to follow on actually to Captain Lindsay's question. The funding model. You know, something up front of the rest by results, basically. Yeah. Is that common across London, in particular our neighbouring boroughs, Westminster and It's It was, I mean, like, like Graham said, that we're one of the only um, boroughs that does the vast majority of our work by subcontracting. So some providers don't do any subcontracting at all. Um, where I came from before in Southwark, so in Southwark Adult Learning, we had um, approximately a third of our delivery was subcontracting and yes that was the same model where we would just do everything in arrears when I was there. So that so that but others I don't I don't hundred percent know. And what about the neighbouring oh the obvious point is Westminster. Westminster is, Westminster. is, is also quite a special case. I mean both both our neighbours have directly delivered services. And Westminster's is huge. I mean it's a, it's, it's the last time I looked it was pounds. it was certainly over 10 million, 30 million pound business. Yeah. We received one point seven. We're very small in comparison to Westminster's uh, service, but it also does uh, up through the qualifications levels and it mm -hmm. delivers additional kind of courses and it taps into to wider funding. Hammersmith, uh, I don't know in terms of volume. direct delivery. It, it is direct delivery scale in terms of I comparison. Don't know. Okay. We could find, we, we, we have sure benchmarked sure. achievement, not just with our names, <laughs> but with other providers too, in terms of how do we sit against. Uh, 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 Is there any correlation between the offspring of gradings of the services that's delivered directly? I think there's only one outstanding yeah, provider, there's, there's which there's Redbridge. One, Redbridge. So and that's the everybody else is good. The adult learning provider I in the, that has a great one. In London. Well, okay. well, and, and all the rest of the London, inner London specifically, they're all grade twos. I, I think Redbridge is. Is it Um. Yeah. My, my question is, um, have we looked at, uh, I mean, teachers, are they currently, the tutors, are they currently local? Do we focus on local, uh, you know, growing our own core of teachers and whatnot? Or is it something um, awarded to um, specific and, and, and you're looking more or less for what they can provide as opposed to you training them up. 
the, the like I said before, the the tutors are um, hired by the organisations who who they're working for. So we have little to do with with that aspect of it, whether we're growing our own. Um, and tutors come from lots of different places across there. They're often hourly paid. They're often doing work for a number of organisations across yeah. London, um, including colleges and some of our local providers. So, so the tutors are um, they're kind of around and about everywhere. So it's sort of it's useful in the, in in the aspect of your sharing practice across multiple mm -hmm. different layers of, of the adult learning sector. In lockdown, I was or in the last couple of years we've been suffering for some of the organisations have been suffering with hiring tutors and I think that there is an um, an issue which which we might want to as a as a centralised sort of part of that deal with which is pay structures and the pay is different but they're, they're, some of them are voluntary sector organisations and so they are not paying their tutors at a, at a going tutor rate potentially and so missing out on filling some of the vacancies and I think about that in terms of maths tutors also in ethos tutors very in demand across the you know as a massive you, you, pounds an hour yeah moment. and you can you can you can deliver as much ESOL as you all of it could be ESOL and and you wouldn't still have enough um so so I think that there's there was a little bit of an issue I was thinking about offering to do a bit of centralized yeah. can we can we talk about these things yeah. together um Equally, the other thing I was sort of thinking would be quite useful is tapping into the retired exactly. people yeah. who, are, who are living in borough yeah. and what yeah. might, I mean, if you could tempt them back to no, do some work, yeah. what, what, you know, what would they be able to offer? And, and, and that's quite an, an open question. But I think that the, the issue that we have is, is when I offered to host a meeting with all of the, our ESOL delivery partners, they weren't really interested in that, in sort of talking about that as a central issue. However, it depends whether they can recruit all the tutors they need. Uh, maybe in time, they will want to come back and we can talk about that. Yeah. And there are local tutors, but we don't stipulate it in, yeah. in a contract that they yeah. need to be. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we covered quite a bit, didn't we? Uh, and I guess. Should we go to seven? Up to you, uh, yeah. Seven, three, is it? Seven, 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 three. Uh, yes. Seven, three, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else to say a little bit to uh, introduce it? Please, that would be great. Um, so it's yeah, the economic development team again falls under um, this uh, portfolio. Um, I think it's actually it's capital to OSC. I don't know specifically, but um, it's one of those um, things that we're very happy to talk about um, this evening. Um, it's, it covers a range of services, so not everything here is necessarily captured. It do so much with it um, as it is, and Graham does a fantastic job uh, in leading the team doing that. Um, but we're going to take um, questions um, on the Mooted priorities for the next 12 months, mm -hmm. um, especially uh, keen on doing um, linking between our schools, that is primary secondary schools, mm -hmm. with future employment potentially, mm -hmm. just getting that a bit better, um, ensuring our employers in the borough, we have many big, very well renowned ones, are engaged with the community. So it's something that's something I'm really driving through the employment forum mm -hmm. um, that Graham does with Helen um, as well, who's our, our, our other officer. Um, and all those kind of visions as well. So we have to take questions from those uh, if you like to reach out. My question is to do with um, when people um, start with this uh, process, come to you for the, your three um, fund skills, enterprise business support, and uh, adult community learning. So if somebody turns up and says, can I have some support with this? Do they go through a process of induction uh, and assessment that defines what it is they're trying to achieve and therefore there is an outcome which is measurable from the process that you've been investing in? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we either work in partnership or we're commissioning some support, for example, in the, the Grenfell employability piece. 
and most of that is access to one-to-one -one personalized employment advisors and one of the first stages is to do an analysis and to develop an individual action plan for that person so you do some analysis and what we what we often find is uh, although it's an employment advice service or it's an employment advice intervention that uh, you don't when when people present themselves they're actually there's a whole multitude of issues that might be there they could have housing issues they could have health issues they could have other other factors that come into it you're not just having a very narrow conversation about the world of work and careers or employment so it, 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 it does tend to broaden out into some of those other aspects in terms of people's finances people's mm -hmm. life situations but yes the personalized element of it there is a there is an assessment and there's a there's an action plan for each person and that's one to one support the action plan would have some outcomes but there are the targets to achieve and are they then followed up and reported uh yes on, on, on what we commission each project has targets and objectives but also there's the uh some people they would go maybe on interim progressive kind of out, outcomes which might be where they go with some skills training or they go confidence building and so on and then if somebody's in work there's a follow-up and, and a period because you're looking at is that work sustained so you're looking at follow-up and support once they're in work in work support once they're there um, so, so it follows through on, on that on that basis. Thank you. Do we um, do we have um, any form of mentoring schemes? So we have many. Just to tell you what Graham says, we have many people that approach us, Graham team, me specifically, sometimes asking for help or a job or whatever else like that. And that could they could be asking a range of things, mm -hmm. like working employment locally. Apprenticeships of which we do offer as, as a council, um, or other forms of um, experience, such as mentoring. Um, we necessarily don't do that ourselves as a council, um, although we can refer to other people through other commission services of which we can do that with. Um, and we host a range of uh, kind of forums for that. Um, again, speaking with businesses, speaking with um, Trades uh, that are based in the borough in order to refer people to, them, to themselves, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, to use that, Graham may have more specific operational details, but um, in terms of the process, we usually have to take. Because with, with the um, Chamber of Co Commerce, for yes. instance, we, this, you know, we have a relationship with them as a council. Yes. And, and that what that body does is actually brings in and, and helps and supports. Business and, and, and different yes. different business. What what I don't understand is um, we have a lot of businesses who want to be a part of the community beyond just being a business and you know, doing um, I don't know streetscapes and, and improvement. And we have a lot of young people who are locally who can actually benefit from some type of mentoring. Yes programs whereby you can marry the two yeah. and, and, and help young people kind of yes. see things in it. That is a really good point and I just chaired our employers for employment for a week or two weeks ago where we kind of discussed about how we can link employers mm -hmm. to people in the borough. We hosted yeah. it in, in uh, Morley College because we thought that was a very good area for, in order for Morley to say what they offer in terms of its, uh, skills and the education also for businesses to tell Morley and us as a council they're okay, looking for as well exactly. and how we can connect the dots. When I go out traveling to the borough of North and South, you often have people come to you and say, I would like some more locally. Um, we've had some businesses <coughs> that have been very that have very big businesses in the borough who have perhaps historically been quite insular. Um, perhaps from most in your ward to check. Um, and we've been trying to encourage them to be a bit more community minded and community focused. So with the likes of the Employers Forum, we've got like the V&A, Natural History Museum, um, uh, some of our larger hotel chains, um, Peter Jones, um, Harvey Nicks, uh, all, a, bit, a lot of the um, health uh, organizations we have in mm -hmm. Harvey Casey, uh, the CISA, but in ICT and Chelsea, Chelsea Western Hospital, uh, and encouraging those organizations to think holistically about local 
clients and local people because we've got a vast range of people in this borough who are looking for some kind of support, either that's mentoring, apprenticeships, better skills, employability, full time, part time, and how to link those two together. So, as an example, um, in the latest data from the census, um, Delgado Award uh, has, has 45% uh, economically inactive. Uh, the second award, also 45%, uh, 45.3%, I think Delgado is 456 around that, we double check because it's Chelsea Riverside. So, we've got nearly half the population of those two wards which are in a particularly form of employment. Now that could be they are uh, retired, uh, they could be sick, or they could generally just be unemployed or neat as well. And uh, Graham and I have been discussing this and said one of the priorities which we've got here for the next 12 months is to really focus on those areas to see what we can do <coughs> where perhaps the longer term problems are, and as Graham said, they could be health related or historic in some ways. How to kind of break that and ensure that those organizations we have in our VKT, some of which are the most famous in the world, can really contribute to that focus. And that is through things like, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, apprenticeships, mentoring, uh, things, things like that as well. Just trying to connect the dots the best way we can. Okay. Well, connect connections is in the facilitation is a key, key element of our work. So we're quite a small team, and we don't set top large commissioning budgets, if I may put it that way. Um, but on the topic of mentoring, for example, Innocent Drinks were very keen to get a mentoring program in a relationship, so we facilitated their link with a school so they could introduce that and work with young people through that. The Chamber of Commerce, you mentioned, is that was actively working with Morley College to offer work experience placements and opportunities to college students. So it's, it's trying to make those positive connections and the local positive connections. And then also to think about on the sector piece about the strong sectors locally, but also the aspirational sectors that, that young residents might want to access, for example, say the financial services or, or legal services or design and architecture and such like. So there's a sectoral piece bubbling around too, as well as just facilitating these links and these partnerships. But with the employers, particularly the larger employers, it's kind of understanding what are they keen to do yeah. locally, uh, and then with the say the schools and the school side, is it where, where do they yeah. say they need help? Because we can't push them, yeah. particularly yeah. canopies, we can't push no, them, no. Yeah. but we can try to work with with their needs and with the employers and try and bring them together. With what things you can't push people anyway. They can't, they yeah. We have commissioned some services whereby we've had um, people locally. They've gone to hospitality training, mm -hmm. for example, just get those skills. Yeah. Um, that's sponsored by RBKC and yeah. Cadogan as well. And uh, we're also working with Cadogan on an apprenticeship scheme as well, yeah. uh, which we have someone uh, in our council officer who's gone through that, who works here now with us, who's gone through that scheme too. So just ensuring that that local aspect is, is, is I mean, we can't make everything right all the time, but yeah. just trying to start that process yeah. and get it up and running. And, and we have some willing participants, yes, we have some willing organisations, yes. which is great. Yeah. Yes, I think there's a, there's a lot of goodwill there, and there's a lot of uh, what we're finding in the employers forum, where we, we did a few pilots with a number of the employers. There's a lot of keenness to work with the schools, actually, and what we need to do is, is work with the complexity sometimes of the school calendar and who is it in the school who's leading on that, hence we reference in here sort of a relaunch in the autumn of the secondary careers leads network for RBKC because it's been a bi-borough careers network yeah. and I think it's slightly fallen away so we want to re-energise the RBKC one with colleagues, Hillary who was in the room earlier with colleagues mm -hmm. in education and bring that together again. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now the last Item is the work program. Thank you, Dory. Um, the is required to develop a detailed uh, work program for 2023-2024, which will be presented to the overview and scrutiny committee on July 5th. The topics that are already that have been agreed uh, included in the work program are safeguarding, 
budget proposal, key performance uh, information. At the works programming workshop on uh, June the 6th, members um, in attendance discussed the long list and also put forward other lines of work. The topics and fee prioritized and noted. Uh, the council first is the council's offer to care leaders up to 25. The second is integrated services, uh, service and early health uh, support provision, children age zero to 11. Uh, that is supposed to be a working group. Uh, the third is youth and community groups across uh, borough with focus on North Kensington. And the final one is education, following the progress of the grant proposal. The select committee is invited to discuss the short list and a brief five topics. Okay, committee. We need to discuss the, the long list that we've been presenting. Well, the, 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 the uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so but I, I guess we agree this, and maybe we can just um, uh, allocate dates, which which uh, is it helpful if I say a bit just to join no. oh, because not everybody was here. Okay, so um, the committee agrees a work program for the year, so there will be some items that you know that you're going to do, but there will be enough flex in that work program that if something comes up during the year, that you can still accommodate it. So I asked for suggestions and they're appended as a long list. Um, there was a workshop which some councillors were able to attend. They looked at the long list and prioritised um, 3.6, the topics there, um, and asked for some further information, paragraph 3.7, for the things that may be included. So the decision about the work programmes made here at this committee, not at the workshop. So we've had a couple of things that have come up since then. Richard suggested something on inclusion and the inclusions pilot linked to the work that committee did. Yeah. Of, yeah. Um, because we had a working group that looked yeah. at school yeah. exclusion. Yeah. yeah. And one of the responses to that from the local, from the council was the inclusion strategy. And I think it's timely that we go back and look at that inclusion strategy and see if that's actually good information. Mm -hmm. so. Very good idea. Uh, my concern sometimes for this group in the committee is we do something in a working group and then it just disappears. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. It's like I couldn't do more. Yeah, so you do get the tracker at this committee which sets out the recommendations. Yeah, the recommendations. It hasn't been here for a while, but well, you're absolutely, absolutely right. The it's mm -hmm. very really ambitious, but yeah. I'd like to yeah. have some sense of whether it should be implemented or not. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, we should have an implementation report to one of our committees. Yes. Yeah. If I think it's a report yeah. as to how far they've gone with the English strategy, what they've achieved, mm -hmm. and someone like Glenn or um, Kathy coming to answer questions about it. Yeah. I, I don't think it's a huge piece of work. Okay. So, so at the moment we've got seven topics. Well, is that seven? Well, you've got um, eight, eight, five confirmed, and then a couple of three additional. But and then two. Don't we have those three? Um, so also tonight, I made some notes during the meeting, and um, and there was some interest in um, the impact of COVID on children and their development. So you might think you've finished that item tonight, or that might be that seemed to be something you were probing and interested in. <laughs> I, I'd be quite against that personally because I think so it's, it's certainly in schools we're so talking about the impact of COVID uh, we seem to be doing nothing on the spot to do that I just wonder whether that's yeah. what the scrutiny we should be doing Okay. Yeah, um, the person that leads everybody else. <laughs> this is no, great. No, 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 no. If I understand it correctly, we've got safeguarding budget proposals, key mm -hmm. reports, reports, information. That's yeah, three. Yeah. That's, but then we've got the other um, four under three point yeah. six. That's seven. One of which is a working group. Yeah. And we've got two items of internal information. Yeah. Which may or may not generate some further work. Yeah. So yeah. we've got space within the, the, the six plus of working group for something to come up later in the year. Yeah. So, I always like, I like usually at least one meeting very light. So okay. We can, so um, we can just <coughs> uh, uh, make room for any anything cropping yeah. up. 
Yeah, so you also said this evening that you wanted um, the new head teacher. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and I think, I think that should be sometime, well, it's, it's going to have to be sometime in the, in the new school year. In the new school year, because yeah. in the autumn, that's the time when you need to look at the same yeah. guardian report, you do that. And, yes. we, need, and we need to let her yeah. kind of settle a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So, so that means actually early next early year. Early next year, maybe, better yeah. than... So January, February. So sure. you don't have to agree... All the dates yes, tonight. Yes. So Bella, who's now um, your quality and scrutiny officer replacing Paula, will work with you as a committee on developing the topics yeah, and, um, and dates. Uh, you know, fleshing out some of these items, dates, and also um, we'll be wanting to do some more visits that were starting to ramp up last year. There was the Grandpa Nursery, the little mm -hmm. libraries. So we'll have some visits. Uh, we'll talk to you about that in connection to the items on the work programme. Okay. Um, so, yeah. It strikes me that that's, sorry, I, I, I'm quite happy to do the work, but one, two, so that's a lot of topics for the year, and I just wonder if we're going to do well. Well, if you think about, we've got another four meetings. So the autumn meeting is going to likely be safeguarding and budget proposals. Okay. Because okay. that's the timing we yeah. have to fit into the yeah. time. And table. KPIs. Well, can we do KPIs? Well? Um, you may be able to do KPIs. So okay. you had a very good, I think, KPI report. Um, this was, they've been to all the committees. Right. You had a very good KPI report. Well, so point four could be one meeting. Yeah. In September. And January, we're talking about school. The school. Yes. Yeah. Quite, that's going to be quite big, isn't it? So the um, integrated service nearly helps support provision for children aged 0 to 11. That was going that's to be a, work, a working group. group. Working group. So that's, well, starts, that's going to be starts, working in the background anyway. It's starting now and going through until January. Um, so um, for that one, um, we'd need between, um, suggest, three or five members, yeah. cross party, properties are obviously welcome to join as well. And you'd need a um, terms of reference to be agreed by the committee for the working group. Any working group should have a terms of reference agreed by the committee. Um, and the project plan attached to that. I don't think this is, 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 I mean, I think we have enough. We don't have a lot. I don't, I don't think it's a lot. I think you've got because capacity to do it's to you, to your committee, your work yeah. programme, but I think you've got capacity to do it. Yeah. More than this, and it would be a lot, but I think this is mm -hmm. just... Well, just on 3.7, we've got children who are not in mainstream alternative provision. I mean, that, that does come under safeguarding. There's normally a, there's normally a section of safeguarding report about yeah. children who are in need. Mm -hmm. Predicted applications for school compared to the number of places. I mean, that is just a nice... That's a... Yeah, that's a... Yeah. School. So I think, yeah, I that's, think that's, that's enough. I, I wonder why that's coming to scrutiny because that's something schools forum looks at all the which, time. Which which one? The predicted predicted school compared mm -hmm. to the number of places. It's, well, it's, 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 it's a piece of information that, that, that the, this committee should be informed about. Right. It's not a piece of work for this committee to do a lot. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. 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 it comes into the public domain. quite a closed closed body, isn't it? It's also depending on the nature of it. <laughs> Fine. Fine. Okay. Just, yeah. Everybody happy? So Bella, be brutal. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot on this. You don't. It, it's up to you. As I say, this is where the decision's made. So scrutiny is council led. Obviously, as so I say, are, we, are we happy with it? Are we happy with it? And I want to see oh, happiness on the other side. Across the across the table from well, Paula's going to have to go to uh, Miss Chair to overview scrutiny on July the fifth. She's also a member of that committee and put forward. And then put this. forward to, yeah. Um, put and forward there'll be a discussion program. there about all the committee work working groups. So councillors can look at any synergies between committees, look at duplication. <laughs> Are we um, in agreement? Yes. So I'm giving the trust I mean, the trust the and the update is just going to be like a. So. But we can go. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so if you think about it, Bella, you could think you could do it. You could do one session on education where we could pick up education following the post of Greenfield Cove. Children are not in mainstream. 
yeah. and predicted applications for school competitive number place. I mean, that could be one meet. One meet, where yeah. We did, we might, yeah. And then children counts off at the care leave at 25 to be able to safeguarding. Yeah. We have to do so safeguarding. Themed meetings yeah. are good meetings, I would suggest. Because yeah. yeah. you yeah. do your safeguarding yeah. meeting is theme meeting yeah. every year, and I think yeah. that is one of the best meetings yeah. that we have. Yeah. We have yeah. to do that. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with you. Um, yeah. You get a, um, you get a work programme report at every meeting, yeah. so you can review it, and you should review it at the meeting. So if you get part way through and you think, oh, we've got too much, then you just readjust. You don't. It's not compulsory. <laughs> you, you, you know. So as you go through, you may add things, you may take things out, other priorities may come up. Okay. Have you know, go chair. Okay. Put these things into, into calendar, then we can see your your lovely idea about. Resources and premises within the Lincoln Authority and how we need to get schools. Is that another lovely idea that I'm working through with that? Well, that comes into Will's, Will's integrated yeah. service yeah. in early health. Sorry, I've yeah. literally just got off the yeah, plane, that, so my mind. Because there's lots of bits that work yeah. very well on their own, but they're not, they're not really connecting yeah. together. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas they could, and they're now, so now so now emerging some examples of where they are connected up and they are getting. Results and they are getting the data out of this. It's not just one or the other. And then you can't just, just apply it across the board like that. It's, it has to be done in a more subtle way. And that's, uh, Could you, sorry, I, I am definitely going to see my head. That's exactly what I love as the big idea. Could we somehow fit within our annual program that almost at the end of each meeting, or the beginning of each meeting, we look at how it's actually, how whatever we've discussed or worked on has led us to getting close to, close to that idea. Because so that we always have that. that I can try to get my brain around that. Brilliant thought. Are you talking about taking the work program as the first item? I think so. No, but let's talk about sure that meeting. Okay. I think you, you, you put your finger on something. So, yeah, but I'm not sure. But I'm not sure. But I think, I'm not sure. I think, I'm not sure we I think we're not going to come to an articulate yeah. yeah. now. Okay, sorry. So, yes, so maybe, is, maybe my brain is very woolly today. Yeah. Well, you said you just got off the plane. Maybe if I play, I did, maybe I you need to kind of slip it off. Compress. You know, get get you know get the jet um, lag. But anyway, if the reality is how we link the things together, so the result is. Better than the sum of the exactly, exactly. I totally agree with you. So, so for example, mm -hmm. the first thing that we might do that. is by having topic focused meetings because out of one, we might feed some of you know, if, if it's all loosely around the same topic, it will yeah. all better inform yeah. all the parts. Okay. So that's Jackie, a good start. Jackie said, when we have safeguarding, and it's informed by. Practical on. exercise on safety. Yeah. Yeah. So Bella will work yes. with you. Bella's a problem on that. Yeah. Bella, what's your sorry, not to put on the what's your sort of background? What 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 I know what Paul Paula used to do and be, etc. Um, yeah. So I've just moved down from West Yorkshire. I used to work at Calderdale Council. I was initially on a grad scheme, a policy and research grad scheme, and then I was working as a scrutiny officer for the past year and a half and then I started here yeah, two weeks ago. So yeah. So, so you're the person like Paula who yeah. sort of writes the reports based on the work. Yeah. And she'll help you with anything as a committee that you want to do outside of a report. Right. So if you wanted a focus group or a meeting or something like that. Yeah. She'll help with the research as well. Paula, what else are they going to do? Okay, so um, any other business? Um, so any, any member? Oh, sorry, I was just going to say. So if I sort of work with Luke because he's yeah. taking the notes, if we get this, um, what what you've agreed tonight, we sort of draft it up. Just yeah. 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 Note, yeah. Get it agreed, and yeah. we need to get that agreed quite soon for overview for publication. Yeah. If we get that, if I can work with Luke, if we can get that into a document for you to look at and agree. You put it in the overview report, and well, I can go and yeah. um, speak I'll to go away for chair. Yeah. I'd also like to bear in mind the well-being of council employees as well, and that we look to try and alleviate 
the amount of times certain individuals have to come and stay very late in the evening. I'm just aware I go to lots of different meetings I, and there are, still, there are some of the same people who stay so very late. So if we could try and work on our agendas so that it will facilitate. I don't know about that. scrutiny, but I know in planning, people who stay that night on planning on Tuesday, they don't work on the Wednesday or they have at the morning or they come in the afternoon. I think Amanda's got a good point there. It's about having um, a really focused meeting. Yeah. That, that's what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. It's about having a really focused meeting. The Constitution says you should have about three agenda items for meeting. So it's about being focused, okay. yeah, media focused, yes. coming to the pre meet But, but oh, this yeah. was a huge number of items, but yeah. actually they were quite small, weren't they? Really? Well, yeah. Because it was just sort of yeah. trying to set the tone for the rest of the year. Yeah, a short, um, short, concise meeting that gets through the school and doesn't do lots of updates. Yeah, like Mary's meetings. Mary's meetings. <laughs> also, didn't they always have to start at 6.30? Yeah, that's yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. Because we have a lot of people. Yeah, that's what I was going to go. Okay, um, again, okay, so any other business? No, and yet, no. So. All right. Everybody, oh, okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank and you, see sir. you next time. Is that cool enough for you? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.